Welcome to this conference. And first, I'd like to thank you to give me the opportunity once again to come to Greece. I have to tell you a very personal experience. I have a very good relationship to Greece because 40 years ago, I met my wife in Greece. And we're still together. So it must be the good Greek spirit. Hmm? Uh, the topic of the talk is uh, from smart metering to smart cities. Let me first start with, uh, the, uh, with the smart cities. Smart cities is something you probably heard about a lot. It's a buzzword, has become a buzzword. Maybe at the end we realize that it is more than just a buzzword. Let's have a look into the crystal ball first. Here we have such a smart city. And I could use one of our company slides for that, which shows all what is around about the smart city. It's about home energy management, so the consumer can use energy much more efficiently by efficiently managing it. It's about distributed generation and storage, so every house has a photovoltaic cell on his uh, roof, or if you live in a windy area, you have your micro turbine on the roof, and of course you have uh, your basement fill, uh, full of batteries to, serve, uh, to save the surplus uh, energy. Then in building and facility energy management, here, I think there it's, it's much more already something which you can do now. I just recently had a talk with the CEO of Siemens Building Control. They claim that 20% of the energy consumed by a commercial building could be delayed of up to eight hours, switch, uh, shifted around the consumption by eight hours, which is quite a sum. Then you have uh, distribution automation and substation automation. I'm sure we will hear more about that from these ex the experts about uh, smart grids. Then street lightning, which you can uh, uh, manage intelligently. Then electrical vehicles. Also, this is something. Uh, you know the topic that uh, you use the battery of the electrical vehicle to s even store energy that you, instead of just leaving it in the garage, not doing anything, at least you can store energy. This is the vision of smart cities. We call it more smart communities because all these things are not just valid in cities, but they are things which should be valuable for the community. Uh, why smart? What is the reason? What are the basic reasons which could lead to such a smart community? I think they are very basic and very straightforward. One is to save energy. And the other one is to replace fossils and fissiles by renewable. Some users of the fossils think they have solved the problem if they replace fossils by fissiles, by nuclear energy. But this solves the CO2 problem, but it doesn't solve the energy problem. And in some countries, it's the other way around. Look at Germany. They switch the nuclear power plants off and then replace it by gas turbines. But that's not what we are speaking about. We are speaking about replacing these by renewable energy. On the one hand side, to save energy. Now we can save energy already today. It's no problem. Just switch it off. Or just increase the price until people switching off. But what people are hoping from smart metering and smart grids, that you can save energy without having the pain for the saving. So to avoid the wasted energy, you want to save that part of the energy which you don't feel anyway, which is wasted. So, and how do you do that? It's by creating awareness, consumption awareness, that you find those things in your household or in your industry which consume energy without creating too much benefit of it. On the other hand, 
it is certainly, if you speak about renewables, it, is, it has two consequences in the production. The production from centralized production, an uh, example of a typical centralized energy production is a nuclear power plant. You produce all your power very centrally. Uh, the contrary is now the case. It is, goes from central production to decentralized production. And the decentralized is OK, because then it goes nearer to the consumer. That's an advantage. But the second one is more of a problem. It goes from deterministic production to stochastic production. You cannot know when the wind blows, or you cannot influence the wind to blow. And you cannot influence the sun if you need in the night energy from solar cells. It's not available. Or if the clouds, here in, here in Greece, it's probably the, the photovoltaic production is not so deterministic like in Middle Europe. And not so stochastic like in Middle Europe. We have much more clouds which come and go. OK, and what do we do now with these technical means of smart metering or smart grid? We want to ba balance the consumption and the production. And we do that by demand response. So the demand has to respond to the stochastic pr production. The balancing between consumption and production is done by physics. In principle, this is not the problem. Physics balance production and consumption by just uh, running down the network. But that we want to avoid. And therefore, we have to interfere with the consumption if the production is not good enough. And also, the other way around, we have to switch off, off X uh, production if you cannot use it. And this is already the case in Germany. In many cases, if it is windy in northern Germany and sunny in southern Germany, and then they have an overproduction. They have to switch off the wind turbines and disconnect the solar cells. OK. How do, can we become smart? We create consumption awareness and balance the demand response. In the middle, who should do that? It's the consumer. It's the consuming industry or the household. And they have to manage their demand. So the consumer, only the consumer can influence the, command, uh, the demand. And then it's, of course, the distribution, the grid, which will influence the whole thing. And in order to influence the demand, you have to know the demand. It's like if you want to lose weight. The first thing you do, you buy some scales. Because if you don't know your weight, you cannot lose it. But by knowing your consumption, you don't have to, uh, you have not lost, by knowing your weight, you have not lost the weight already. And it's the same here. By introducing a smart meter, you have not saved one kilowatt hour of energy, but you enable the customers to do it. And how do you do it? You do it with these smart meters, which give the possibility to the customer to get more awareness. And you have to bring this consumption information to the customer. This can be done with customers, displays, or whatever. And finally, to do this balancing also in the grid, you need smart grids. Now, these are the components, but in order that to work fine, you have to connect these components together. You have to introduce communication. And the second thing is, if you have communication, things have to communicate. But it is not good enough if you provide the communication means. You have also to make sure that these things are all interoperable, that you, these machines can communicate to each other, exchange data with each other. Otherwise, the whole thing will not work. OK, saving experience. Here, I just take out one. There are big reports about everything. I just took out one, which I, I think gives a nice, interesting uh, fact on that. This is a, a, an investigation this uh, institute is in uh, Finland did on different creating awareness. So they uh, published the, the consumption on a website or information, informative bill 
or an in-house display or an ambient in-house display. What does that mean? I mean, in the early projects, what we did, we looked at this much too technical. We just displayed the kilowatt, the kilowatts or the kilowatt hours in this display. But people cannot do anything with that. It's too abstract. These ambient displays means that this information is more integrated into the daily life. For instance, that you give a lamp which shows, which is red if you are above average consumption or if you are above a benchmarking consumption, a similar family in a situ similar situation, or you can even set your own benchmark. So the lamp is red when you consume too much and it's green when you're below average. And this would mean whenever you see this red lamp, you start thinking about what did I switch on now which brings such a high consumption. This is what they mean by ambient display. So you see this, uh, this reduction of overall energy consumption varies between uh, 4 and 11%. And what we learned from that is the better consum consumption information is linked into the daily life, the higher the savings. And this is, I guess, still a possibility for innovation to bring, to display this information in a way that the customer can use it. Okay, now smart metering experience. What do we have in Europe? Now, let's open the curtain. And here I displayed a couple of projects from our experience. It's, of course, there are other companies who have similar experience, but I cannot speak of the others. I have to speak for ourselves. So when you look at, this is the snow, okay. If you look in the north, in Scandinavia, these were the earlier projects, and also in Italy. If you look at the north, there, uh, Scandinavia is Sweden. They introduced smart metering not also by law, but not by prescribing, making a law that smart meters have to be installed, but making a very simple law that every customer has to get every month a bill which reflects actual consumption. No more estimated bills. And this has the effect that the utilities installed all smart meters or meters which have uh, remote, are remotely read. And then you see here, these projects, these were my mostly turnkey projects. Landes and gear projects where we took the responsibility of from the meter to the head-end system, to the billing system, and also in sometimes to servicing the system and also operating it. Similar in uh, Sweden. Then we have an interesting one also in uh, Italy, that was the very first one. You know that NL in Italy started to introduce uh, smart metering and then the city of Rome decided that they want to be independent of, uh, of uh, NL and then we got this project here, there, 1.6 million meters. Uh, by the way, which were all produced in Greece and then uh, we have a newer one in uh, the, uh, Estonia and British Gas. That's also an interesting one because this is, now we see these are the newer ones where we have a combination, not just electricity, but also gas. Combination of gas, uh, uh, smart gas meters, which have a valve in it, and also display, in-home display. This is uh, now introduced in Great Britain. But all these projects are pure manufacturer projects. The manufacturer took the responsibility on the project. We took the responsibility. Then we have new projects with interoperable meters, like for instance in Spain, where Iberdrola took the responsibility on the project. We just delivered the meters. Similar one in ERDF in France. EDF takes the responsibility on the meter. And then you have interoperable meters from several manufacturers. These are different things. There, we as manufacturer, we just deliver the meters with the communication unit to it. But we don't take over the overall responsibility. We don't take over the responsibility that in, within two days you have to reach 99% of all meters. 
here, we just deliver the devices. And then we have now started an initiative between several meter manufacturers to provide interoperability also from uh, meter manufacturers. We have some projects, too, at the moment in Europe, one in Switzerland and one in uh, Poland, where we have meters from different manufacturers in the same system, but the project the, the, the interoperability is not defined by the utility, but by the manufacturers. The smart mandate. So, the European uh, Union uh, made this uh, third package of the energy in initiative, but then uh, they also said, ah, in order to, to implement this energy initiative, we want to enable smart meters and smart grids. And then they heard, heard the, the feedback from the utilities. Yeah, but we don't know what. There is no standard and so on. There is no interoperability. And then the European Commission said, OK, we help you. We issue a mandate. We issue mandates for standardization. But what they meant is interoperability. And they gave to the standardization, uh, standardization organizations these two mandates the mandate on smart metering to make standards for smart metering and, to make a ma and the mandate for 90 for smart grids to make standards for smart grid. The European Commission made something much better than the U US government did. The US government did something similar. They gave also the mandate to standardization organization, but they paid them for that. That's the worst thing you can do. If you pay standardization organization, they will produce paper, paper, and paper. Here, at least, they didn't give money. The result is enough paper already, but at least it is not subsidized with European money, because that would be the worst. All the consultants would go and write papers. That's what's happening in the US. And as soon as the subsidies is finished, also the whole project dies, because there is no market behind it. Here, the result. Also, in Europe, of course, the result of any standardization activity is paper. There's nothing else in a, in a standard. It's paper. A standard is not a law, it's not a product, it's just paper. How do we achieve now interoperability with this paper? It is paper, but it is paper which has two good things. First, there is a certain consensus behind it because there is a well-defined procedure how you come to these standards. And second, the standardization organization look after that there are no hidden IPR rights behind what is described here. So everybody can produce products after according to these standards, because there are no hidden patents or anything behind it. But there are no products, it's paper. How do we come to products? How do we achieve interoperability? Now, finally, first, out of these huge mass of standards, we have to choose one. We have to decide on something. Otherwise, it's never interoperable. And that's, that's a process which hurts, because it hurts not only the manufacturer. It hurts only the users. Also, the users, they have to decide on something. Then you have to write a companion specification because a standard always leaves open several options and you have to define these options. The market, that is very important. You, you can go as a utility and define your own standard. As long as there is no market for products according to the standards, I can guarantee you all the manufacturers will just produce slides for it, no products. Products will only come with the, manuf uh, with, the, with the market. And if the market is not big enough, you will not attract 10 different manufacturers. Then you have also to make sure that the manufacturers keep your promises, their promises. They will all tell you it's interoperable. But you will only feel that it is non-interoperable once you have it in the field, and then it's too late. Then you are left with the problems. Therefore, you have to test the equipment before you put it in the field. And somebody has to establish these neutral te uh, test facilities. And everything together needs one chef. 
Somebody has to take the responsibility. Otherwise, it's just slideware. Somebody has to make sure that you get interoperable equipment. Who can do it? Let's look uh, what, what happens. Single utilities can do it. We have examples. EDF and Iberdrola, for instance, in Europe. They do it. And what is the result? They have a utility-specific solution which is supported by several manufacturers. They have interoperable meters from several manufacturers according to a very specific specification of ERDF or Iberdrola. We have another example. Utility Association can also, can also do it. We have an example in Holland. Their Utility Association, they defined their smart meters. What the result is here, a country-specific solution, which is also supported by several manufacturers. Now, there are cases which cannot be covered with this model. And therefore, the manufacturer association, a manufacturer association was formed. It's called IDIS, Interoperable Device Interface Specification. And we took exactly the same role as these. But at the end, we want to provide a universal solution offered by several manufacturers. So nothing which is country-specific and nothing which is utility-specific. Uh, you also a solution which doesn't depend on a specific communication technology, but which it can be mapped to any communication technology. There you find more information at this, uh, on this website. Okay. Now, we heard, started with the smart cities. At the end, when it became more concrete, we were left a little bit with the smart meter. I claim it's the first step towards a smart, me a smart city, and it's the first thing at the ne in the next couple of years where we have to decide which way to go. The utility, the community have to decide in which way to go.